Well, I must clarify first that uh, one can't talk uh, of the peaceful use of nuclear energy only in relation to and after Pokhran 1. As you know, nuclear energy has its most important single use in terms of providing electricity. And that is the major reason why the nuclear program of India was started by Homi Bhava. And the concept of his goes back to a period when most people in this country didn't know what nuclear physics was and nuclear energy was. Homi Bhava had written about this in a letter to Mr. J.R.D. Tata and a further proposal to the Sir Dorab Tata Trust in 1943 and 1944. In that letter, Homi Bhava had written, and I quote, Moreover, when nuclear energy can be used for power production, India will not have to look abroad for its experts. So he was thinking of power production. That is how the Department of Atomic Energy was set up, the Atomic Energy Commission, the entire program, reactor building. And that is the basis of our capabilities in the field of nuclear energy. From that arose capabilities which relate to nuclear materials, to the thorium plant, the uranium metal plant, the plutonium plant, and so on. And it is precisely extraordinarily pure nuclear materials that are called for in the case of nuclear explosions. Furthermore, you talked about the Pokhran explosion of 1974. That was based then on plutonium which was extracted by operating of a reactor. And it is such reactors that we have in the country on which we have a total capability to design, to construct, to operate, and all the technologies that underpin it from the mining for uranium, from heavy water, from all the nuclear control systems, the reactor engineering, and the fullest knowledge of the nuclear physics relating to the behavior of neutrons in materials. Pokhran in 1974 was called a peaceful nuclear explosion. It was an explosion. It's called a PNE. One could have called it, and as you know, last year there was a semantic debate involving two of the persons who were concerned with that, Raja Ramanna and Homi Setna, and also the then Prime Minister Indra Kumar Gujral, when the argument was, was it a peaceful nuclear explosion or an atomic bomb? The fact is, it was a violent explosion of the order of 20 kilotons. Whereas in the case of a nuclear reactor, which is used for power generation, it operates on a continuing basis so that you get heat, and from that heat, you can generate power. Now, of course, you ask, are there peaceful uses of nuclear explosions? They have been used or not. And many uses have been talked about. Suppose you want to use, instead of a vast quantity of dynamite, to change the course of a river, to excavate, then obviously you need a very powerful explosion. On the other hand, though, people have said that though these are potential uses, the extent to which such uses have been made use of has been very limited. Therefore, really speaking, these explosions relate to capabilities which underpin ultimately nuclear weapons. Well, one should um, ask oneself how we got into this area at all. As far as India was concerned, right from the beginning, Homi Bhabha, Jawaharlal Nehru, the architects of India's nuclear program from the early days were concerned with using it for power generation. And there's a very, very good rationale behind that. But in 1964, China exploded a nuclear weapon. And in a speech given on All India Radio, on United Nations Day, Homi Bhava made reference to it. 
and said, this puts us in a difficult position. I don't intend quoting from his speech of that time, but more or less to indicate that unless the world changed in a way which would not make it necessary for India to go into this area, we might be compelled to go in for it. That was 1964. For 10 years, nothing was done. In 1974, the explosion did take place at Pokhran, called the p &E. Thereafter, in principle, India could have proceeded along that pathway. After all, it had reactors. From reactors, you can extract plutonium. And it can also develop the capabilities. I mean, these are not impossible. They are fairly standard technologies, except it means developing them for the purpose of separating uranium. As you probably know, in the historical past, in the Manhattan Project, the weapons which were made, dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were of two different types. The one used over Nagasaki was essentially one made from plutonium. And that is from reactor piles, which were operated. But the one dropped over Hiroshima involved enriched uranium, which was extracted from normal uranium, uranium-235 extracted from normal uranium, where there's a very small quantity of it, by brute force separation using electromagnetic techniques. Now that, of course, uses enormous quantity of power. So there are other techniques in use today, <coughs> barrier separation, centrifuges, and so on. So India could have developed that, and therefore all these capabilities have since come about. But the fact remains, we could have done it. But India abstained. What people tend to forget is that for a period from 74 to 98, for 24 years, India waited for the world to change so that there would be nuclear disarmament. It has not taken place, except to the extent that there was the end of the Cold War, of the so-called superpower confrontation involving the USA and the USSR. That's all. However, there are still the classical nuclear weapon states as defined in the NPT. India is not one of them because it did not conduct an explosion before that due date. And therefore, it is treated as one of the have-nots. Now, this, I think, makes no sense whatsoever. That is, the world is divided into the nuclear haves and the nuclear have-nots. Now, you might ask, what's the compulsion for carrying out the test at this stage? There are two features. One is, there is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTB uh, T, which will come into force. And after that, one should not conduct any further nuclear tests. That's one aspect. The second is that for a long time now one has been aware of capabilities in Pakistan relating to this nuclear explosion area. One also has been in the know of very considerable assistance received by Pakistan from China. And these are the two countries with whom we have a very long border. Therefore, India could have meaningful security considerations, we have no intention of being aggressive, of going to war with any country, of using nuclear weapons against anybody. That is not the point. However, India still faces a threat. Here is a very large country, China, which is a nuclear superpower. They do provide assistance to Pakistan, and we have a long border with them too. And therefore, for one's own sense of self-confidence, purely as a deterrent, it would be justified to have nuclear system. That is principally the background to it. Apart from that, of course, Pakistan had made statements relating to the Gauri missile, which is a 1500 kilometer missile like our Agni-1. Now all that is something which gives a sense of insecurity. The other aspect, of course, and I think that's more important, that India has done it now, Pakistan has done it, 
we know there are a number of countries in the world which either have it and have not disclosed it, one is aware of them, and others which have potential capability. So this artificial definition of a nuclear weapon state and a non-weapon state is apartheid, as we know, which we have fought against in the case of the black-white issue in South Africa, but in the nuclear area. Therefore, really speaking, we ought to project it. And so should Pakistan, not as a matter between our two countries, but as a matter where we stand solidly against discrimination.